in the spirit of, of the conference that we're at, uh, to, to start with Hebrews 10, this has become kind of a theme verse for us um, as we've reflected on who are we as an association of ministers, pastors, and leaders in the Evangelical Free Church. And Hebrews 10, 24 really captures that. So let me just read a couple verses from this that lead up to that. Um, and then I'd like to, to pray again for us. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray together. Our, our Heavenly Father, we, we praise you that we can gather as brothers in arms to celebrate your grace to your people throughout the centuries. We praise you above all, Lord Jesus, as our high priest, as our mediator. We praise you for the confidence that we have to come before our holy and glorious Heavenly Father in your name covered in your blood, and we praise you for the fellowship that we have with one another because you have united us as one in you. And we, we pray along these lines for our entire movement that, Lord, may we all be one with one another, that the world might see that unity and believe. May we be one as you are one, that we might love one another well and serve one another well and build up your church and spur one another on to love and good deeds. We pray for our brothers, our sisters, our missionaries, our chaplains, all who serve you as part of this movement. We pray that you would build up those who are discouraged, that you would give power and strength to those who are serving on the front lines in difficult areas where people are not responding. We pray for a great spirit of unity uh, among all of our pastors. We thank you so much, Lord, for the, the leaders in the districts, in the national office. We thank you for how they serve so faithfully. We thank you for Kevin bringing him to us for such a time as this. And we pray for him for great wisdom in structuring ministry to best serve our churches. And that's our desire, Lord. Would you lead us that we might join you in building up your church for your glory, for the advance of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wanted to start just uh, showing you, we, we set up a very, very simple website um, just so you could get this presentation. Um, it's right there, efcanetwork.wordpress. That's not an announcement that the network is real. And if you go to that website, you will quickly find that there is nothing there except this PowerPoint. Um, but I thought that'd be a convenient way for people just to find it and um, you'll see that what it says there is it's an ongoing discussion and proposal. So that's what we're here for, is to start a discussion with a couple pieces of paper on the table. And, and uh, I've, I've been a pastor now for 15 years, um, serving my uh, fourth church in, in different ministries. I've been a youth pastor, a family pastor, an associate pastor, a solo pastor, and now I am a pastor of outreach joyfully focused on mobilizing a congregation to proclaim the good news. And um, so I've served in different capacities and one of the things that has kept me in ministry and kept me energized for ministry is fellowship with fellow pastors. Uh, when I was a solo pastor in Kentucky, it was one of the most challenging seasons of my ministry. And one of the things that kept me going was I was a part of two different clusters, actually. We had a free church cluster that met, and then we called them RPMs there in the Southeast. And, uh, and I had uh, an area, a regional pastors uh, group in the city of Louisville. And uh, those two things breathed life into my soul and gave me fresh vision for the work of ministry. 
Um, and so that was a lot of what connected me with this one. When Glenn came to me four years ago and said, hey, they're, uh, they're looking for some fresh energy on the Ministerial Association, I said what a lot of people say. I said, what, what is that? Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I was honored to be invited into the conversation, came into the conversation, and, uh, and, and had the privilege of learning from John Herman and getting uh, over a year of history from him and, uh, and then moving into this time of transition. So the entire four years that I've been a part of the ministerial board, we've been processing the past and our values and the opportunities and the challenges, what can be done, what should be done. And so this is in some ways the uh, the progress that we've made, and I hope to all of you it feels like progress. We've, we've talked, uh, between the five of us on the board, we've talked to 40 or 50 former leaders in the association and district superintendents or district care leaders, and, and we've gotten a lot of feedback already. So we want to make that clear at the outset. This is the beginning of a conversation. It's the beginning of a discussion. We've tried to engage people in it, and we've actually refined the two-page paper you received has been edited at least six or eight times um, after receiving feedback. This, this PowerPoint actually was edited three times today. Um, so to the chagrin of our technology team, but we thank those guys uh, back there for their flexibility. Um, so what this is moving towards is this time next year, we'll, we'll put forward a, a proposal to, to change the constitution and bylaws. And at that point, we'll make it official. Um, so we'll have that all ironed out, and I'll walk through that timeline in just a minute. But that's that's what this is. That's what it's about. Let me um, let me just walk through a little bit of history. Through this, I just felt like we needed to understand our our roots. And as I started researching the association, the last history that had been written on the ministerial association was by uh, Roy Thompson in 1969. And uh, so I, I followed his trail and went down into the archives in Trinity and the archives in Minneapolis and, and pulled out some stuff, dusted off some things. And um, we've already gotten a history, so this is just some bullet points for you. But our, this is our background. This is our, our uh, legacy, is that 17th century pietism that fed into those 19th century revivals in Sweden, in Norway, and then here in America. Our original rallying cry was communion. That was interesting to me, that it was, it was communion societies in, in state churches where believers wanted to celebrate the Lord's Supper with actual believers rather than people that would be fined a dollar if they didn't come to worship. How the law was written uh, in, over there. And, and then the, the influx of Scandinavians, 2.4 million in that stretch leading up to World War II. Uh, Waldenstrom, who, who coined that phrase, where stands it written, and uh, he's a fascinating character in history. If he would not pass credentialing today, uh, if if he were up before one of our our boards, and uh, but but he he articulated that phrase that is so foundational to our movement. And and Franson, who is claimed by I think almost every denomination in America as one of their pioneers, but we claim him as a mobilizer of mission. And, uh, and a missionary uh, to the Swedes who were settling in Utah, uh, Princell, the early professor of the movement who fought, fought so hard for independence that he vilified the very keeping of records. So you go back to those early histories from the 20s and 30s and they lament the lack of membership roles, roles and documentations from the early days because it was of the devil to keep track of those things according to Professor Princell. So you can track that if you're interested in the history and there's a, there's a paper on that website if you wanna read that. One of the early articulations of the purpose of the Association of Churches came from the founder of the Free Church in Denmark and he said it this way, the purpose is to form a union of truly free churches to unite in the common task of gospel proclamation, winning the loss both at home and overseas, to encourage and edify one another, a membership composed of true believers only, free to administer its own affairs. So in that statement, you can see the four goals of the free church articulated, mobilizing mission being the first thing that brought those founders together. 
protecting theological and moral integrity, preser preserving the independence of the local church, and centered around the, the need for fellowship and encouragement with one another. So briefly to walk through those, the first one to mobilize mission, Haleen said it this way in 34 at the 50th anniversary, the free church was not organized as a denomination. In fact, they were vehemently opposed to the whole idea of denominationalism. It was intended to be a missionary enterprise. All were on fire for the saving of as many souls as possible in as little time as possible. Jesus was coming soon. Doesn't that express the spirit of those early pioneers? Mobilizing mission was at the heart of the movement in the beginning. But number two, what they, what they learned in 1893, after about nine years together of let's just go after the harvest, they, they realized that they needed a distinction between ministers who were just calling themselves free church pastors, because there wasn't even a list at that point, and those who were truly recognized by their theology and character. And so uh, worthy as well as unworthy preachers were identifying themselves with our mission until they finally said we need a ministerial association that would become a barrier between those who were unworthy of confidence and those who were truly recognizable. And that, that was where uh, the 1894 Association set up the ordination process that we still utilize today. Um, even though the Norwegians didn't have a form, I'm, I'm on the Swedish side of this aisle here, uh, the Norwegians didn't have an official association, they just had a, a list. We don't have to take sides, I guess, but uh, that's how that goes. Um, so you see the progression, mobilizing mission, protecting integrity, preserving independence. Franson said each church its own synod, and uh, there's a lot more that could be said about that. But there, there is a key element to that in terms of who we are as a movement. We are the free church. We are free church pastors. Independence is rooted in our DNA for better and for worse. And each church is, is autonomous, and a lot of us feel that, that each pastor is also autonomous. But as we were wrestling with the identity of the ministerial association, as we were talking about the decline in involvement, the lack of interest in younger pastors, lack of understanding, and we were saying, is, is there something in this worth preserving? Or is this an institution that has served its time and it's time to gracefully retire it. And this was really the issue as I studied the history that turned it for me. And, and we were actually in a meeting all together with the board, with Kevin, with, with Bill Hamill. And, and it was this issue of our central identity as being free church pastors that if we dissolve the association of our pastors, we, we lose something that is very essential to our identity. And I think it goes back to that value of of preserving our independence. The fourth point has become really our central point of encouraging one another. Three quick aspects to that that we see in the history. Fellowship, of course, with one another. Relationship among each other. Education was a big part of it early on because the schools weren't set up until 19, uh, 1910 or after. And so they needed these conferences to come together and encourage one another and be grounded. At first, the guys didn't think there was time for education. They had to get out and reach, reach souls before Jesus came back. So it was an innovation to say, maybe we better have some theological education. But before, until then, they had conferences and they would gather to study the Bible together. Um, then they set up mutual assistance when the first free church pastors were coming to the end of their energy and had no retirement and no plan to care for themselves. And so the initial $5 dues that was collected was literally the first retirement program of the evangelical free church movement. And uh, they, they said that the, the goal in 1909, the association expanded their purpose to promote and extend the work of the Lord by preaching the gospel and also to foster more intimate fellowship among the brethren in an affectionate and loving manner to be of assistance to one another, which is why in 1910 they founded the old folks home in Iowa and created a place where, uh, where the, the pastors could retire and be cared for. And you can see that progression of finally after, uh, in, in World War II in that time, after the depression, setting up a retirement program, formalizing that in 71 as FCMM. In 91, significant timing to set up a, an executive director of pastoral care ministries, starting minister connections. So you see that encouraging, serving, supporting one another 
and building the structures that would facilitate that. Then we see one of the, one of the key components of mutual encouragement was, was prayer. Uh, A.J. Thorwall said it this way in, uh, trying to get the connection, there we go. In 1934, he said, we feel that a week of united prayer would do much to strengthen our arms in our fight against apostasy, worldliness, and spiritual lethargy. As a group of Christians who stand for true Christianity, endeavoring to hold forth the gospel light in a darkening age, we have a great and important place to fill in this midnight hour. May the holy flame that has continued to burn upon the altars of our free churches since the early years of the work blaze anew with divine presence from coast to coast. They would challenge each other regularly with a call to devoting a week to prayer together and individually and in the churches. Is that not a call that should be reinforced again today and that could come through an association of pastors mutually encouraging one another and calling upon each other to again elevate the urgency and importance of prayer. Then to talk about the turning point that happened in 2003, really a lot of what we're doing in this proposal is we are bringing our constitution and bylaws up to date with a decision that was actually made back in 2004. The members of the association gave their support, John Herman writes, to serve an expanded constituency while retaining an identifiable membership as a base for the ministry Additional resources have become available through the creation of a pastoral care department to assure that all EFCA pastors have access to the pastoral resources and care that will enable them to serve with excellence for a sustained period of time. So that was the turning point in terms of the structure. So here's a real brief intro to the proposal. We want to repurpose, restructure, re-energize, and then relaunch the ministerial association. And we thought a new name might help with that. Originally, we had said the EFCA Pastors Network. And some of the, the kind of strong feedback we got was the term fa pastor felt exclusive to some of our chaplains, missionaries, and women. So now we're, now we're saying, okay, let's just call it the network or the, the leadership network. But the intent, and you can see the focusing of the, on that center circle to say, we wanna focus on mutual encouragement, mobilizing leader to leader encouragement based on that Hebrews 10 passage, working directly, here's the strategy, working directly and closely and in an ongoing way with district superintendents to identify and support regional mobilizers. But one of the, the main questions we've gotten, especially from district leaders is, are we replacing something? Are we trying to compete with what's happening? The whole intent here is that as an association, we have no real interest in creating anything new. We wanna be promoters and supporters and cheerleaders for what is already happening. So the mobilization that we wanna put in place is a grassroots pastor to pastor encouragement and challenge to go to your regional cluster that's administered by your district. Go to your district conference and be equipped and encouraged. Go to EFCA1. It's giving that motivation and encouragement from a one anothering perspective. We're, we're thinking that the message, if we adjust it from a join our professional association to a message of you are a part of our movement, as a free church pastor, you are a part of this movement. You are a part of our association. So we're inviting you then to invest in the movement and engage in the movement of which you are a part. And so dues are a little bit of an old school mentality. So we're thinking if we shift that to voluntary contributions, in a sense, we are thinking reduce taxes to raise revenue um, without getting too politicized there. More, the results that we'd look for would be more leaders connected, whether that's pastors or missionaries or chaplains or, or directors of ministries, healthier ministers when we're connected better, stronger identity as leaders within the free church or renewed energy for shared missions. So the encouragement of one another would still ripple out to fuel mission, to protect integrity, to hopefully increase credentialing, to preserve then our independence as we hear from pastors, another vehicle to gather and hear from pastors and advocate on your behalf um, upward and, and sideways and wherever we can. This is a quick picture of what that might look like in terms of a tool we could use 
for pastors as they meet with each other to walk through, kind of like what you would do in your church with a discipleship pathway. pathway. This could be like our encouragement pathway for one another. Hey, you're a free church pastor. Why don't you make a commitment, even if it's a small $25 a year, $10 a year, just make an initial commitment. And we want to deliver some kind of a tangible, like a, some kind of a national social network. Folks are using Yammer. We might do something along those lines. So then there's a, what am I getting for this? And it, and it immediately connects you with something that, that helps you then connect with, with others and, and, and deliver something that would be helpful for you. Along with that connection, then we'd say, okay, you're, you've made a commitment, get connected. That's the main thing that this association, that the network would be about, encouraging guys to be in regular fellowship with one another. And then there'd be a natural next step for within those relationships to say, hey, have you pursued your credentialing? Have you started that process? Just like you'd hope for with a, an older pastor, with a younger pastor comes on as an associate, that kind of relational encouragement to say, get started on that, get to work on it. It's going to help you. It's going to protect our movement moving forward. And then that top level of cash, when we say that, we're not thinking about dues. When we think about that, getting, moving people along this path of relational encouragement, mutual exhortation is getting them to that point of, of thinking, I am invested. This is my movement. So I want to not just invest in that with some dues that are going to help my fellow pastors and maybe help us hire a director of the network who can expand that. I want to invest myself and lead my church to invest in the movement overall. Are we supporting REACH Global Missionaries? Are we supporting district and national? Are we participating in fair share? It's that kind of thing that we're looking for to create a grassroots motivation and encouragement. Real briefly, and again, you can get this online. So if you want the numbers, here are the numbers. You can see there was a high and there was a low. Um, and, and we saw this picture, a lot of the decline is, is not so much, our total numbers aren't that bad actually, 1337. It's the dues paying that's a little bit on a decline, and so we, that's something we need to um, turn around, and so this slide kind of shows that. We've got a number of, we got graduates, you know, we've got, um, and so praise the Lord for that. Um, here's the picture for me, okay? Forgive the analogy, this is very simplistic, okay? But if you look at it like this, if our whole movement is a tricycle, there's some humility in that, right? Churches thrive as pastors lead. I think we've all experienced that, right? Uh, we've all had our struggles in maybe not leading with the most clarity or with the most integrity. But churches thrive as pastors lead. And, and all we are is an association of autonomous churches. That's what we are. We want our churches to thrive. So I pictured this. Kevin and Greg kind of blessed this with some reservation. But the, as district and national provide support, and, and we, we feel that from all these guys. Their, their heart is to serve us. Their heart is to serve the church. And so here's the emphasis for the network. That, that's the role of the network is to connect pastors so that they can be healthier and growing and encouraged and pursuing credentialing and invested in the movement and engaging so that the churches can thrive. And, uh, you know, if you, if you picture the free church as a child on a tricycle, it's probably a little too simple. It's probably really, it should be about 1,500 cats trying to climb around that tricycle, right? If we really pictured it. So we're trying to build a basket so they can kind of come along. It starts to break down. But there, there's, there's the idea. And really, if I, if I could have read on this slide, I would have put the network on the bottom. This is, this is the opposite of a top-down initiative. This is a, this is a bottom-up initiative. This is a, each of us uh, engaging with one another and encouraging our fellow pastors and leaders to do the same. And, uh, and so, okay, just a few goals here. Um, our, our main goal this year is to process feedback from you. So that's what we want to do in one minute. We, we also want to clarify and integrate this proposal with our districts and with our national structure. And, uh, and we, we so appreciate Kevin and his leadership and, and uh, things are restructuring at the national level. And so that is affecting our association. There's some moving pieces still, um, but the main outcome for us right now is that we have gained Fritz Dale. Um, we, we still, I'm told, have access to Greg Strand, and he's been our main point of contact, but we are adding to that also now uh, Fritz, who will be um, our main liaison with the national office. And, uh, and, and so that's one of our goals is to, is to work with uh, the national guys and work especially with the district superintendents. Uh, Kurt's planning on going to one of their clusters. I'm planning on going to another cluster. So, uh, and we want to engage with them personally, individually. Um, we have no interest in duplicating or competing. 
Um, our heart is, is partnership. I have felt in the last few months like, uh, like grease on a wheel, and I love that. I think as a ministerial association board, if, if we can be grease on the wheels to help make this movement go, then praise the Lord, I think we're doing our role. Um, we wanna finalize the proposal. That's the goal for September or October, um, is to update this with updated constitution. We wanna celebrate and propo- promote the legacy of the free church and then, uh, and then get started with the DSs and doing some of this mobilization. Uh, the timeline, we're in it. Uh, here's the announcement, here's the proposal. We'll process that feedback. We'd like to pull together a meeting at EFCA One. One of the main reasons for that is that we'd, uh, and, and now if we can, um, Todd, you wanna pass around those uh, budget proposals. Um, we wanted to break down some of the finances for you. So these will come around, you can pass those around. But one of the main ideas in that budget proposal um, that you'll see on the screen here is the potential of hiring an executive director for the association. Uh, One of the advantages of Fritz being the one to provide oversight for the association is that that idea of funding a national director director for pastoral care ministries is now by and large unnecessary. We get the leadership and the liaison from Fritz and uh, and the pastoral care um, mainly provided through the districts and so that frees up our funding stream and makes it possible for us to consider this year hiring a director for the ministerial association and that'll help us distinguish some of some of what there's still a little bit of confusion over what's pastoral care ministries what's the ministerial association so that's one of the tasks of this year is to make a clear dichotomy between those two things and so that's the main financial thing that we're looking for your approval on and input on is uh, is having that flexibility from a funding perspective